I have to say that I've always been troubled by the Kol Nidre prayer. And as a rabbi, you think this is the quintessential prayer, essentially, of our liturgical year. I would have found some way to find something that I enjoy about the prayer. Well, I, I will rest assured and tell you that I'm not the only rabbi who was deeply troubled by this. In fact, there was a time when there was a great fighting over this prayer and there was a movement to actually excise it from the prayer book. But the lay leadership decided, lo and behold, they couldn't deal without this prayer and it remained in our prayer books. But what is it that I find so troubling? Well, we make a promise, we make a vow, and we let it go. What's the deal with that? Why can't we keep our promises? Why can't we keep our word? Why is it that we let go at various times? Perhaps there is something in this process regarding atonement that is so imperative. When we think about holding on to our pain, though, I want to point something out specifically about it. Think about it just for a moment. If you are sitting in your anger, then you don't have to think or worry about what you can did to contribute to a situation, especially if this is pertaining to an interpersonal interaction. You yourself don't even have to acknowledge that you were part of the system which led to this negative interplay. In a way, it kind of gets you off the hook. You can play the victim. You don't have to worry about anything. You're released from all sorts of responsibilities. In fact, there's a whole concept that we all have at times where I think Kol Nidre may even come into play with our nedarim, our vows. If you're familiar with the economic understanding of the sunk cost, that we, in fact, will have a tendency when we are engaging in behavior to trudge ahead and along with a plan or an action long after it has become apparent that in doing so, we have ceased to benefit from it. You may wonder, that can't be. Of course, we at some point would have known that we have ceased to benefit. And yet I'll remind you that it was General Motors management who reluctantly moved away from a once winning strategy, which eventually contributed to the firm's decline. That it was the aviation throwing good money after bad money after bad money after bad money that finally led to the Concord project being shut down. And that it was the U.S. military's prolonged campaign in Vietnam and Iraq which suggests that, in fact, sunk cost fallacy can be part of our interactions. We just, at times, want to keep going. It's hard to admit that the river that we were stepping into, a river which we were so certain we knew exactly what was going on in it, it was static in a way in our own minds, may not actually be that same river. There was and is a phrase from Heraclitus, no man ever steps in the same river twice something that I think for most of us makes a lot of sense. If you're out in nature, after all, water's moving, it's constantly flowing, situations are changing. Most of the time, we stop at that part of his quote and fail to remember the B sentence that goes along with it, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. What I thought I knew about the river before I stepped into it may not be actually what I know, and what I thought about me may not actually be true as I step back into it. We, after all, crave life to be static. We make vows in static space. We invest in static moments, and at times we are simply unwilling to see how bo much both I have changed and how much the river has changed. In truth, 
There is constantly a changing thing in life. And Kul Nidre at its core is about letting go. It's about letting go and acknowledging that we are fundamentally different people today than we were a year ago. A year ago, it made sense to make that vow. A year ago, it made sense to make that promise to ourselves. We didn't think about the changing world that we live in. We were focused on what the outcome was going to be. We had those expectations high up. Expectations, after all, mean predictability. Predictability means security, and security means a sense of safety. But in truth, again, that same river is changing, and we are changing. I received a call a few weeks ago from a colleague who retired several years ago and remained living in the community where in which she had retired but she moved recently because of COVID and grandkids and all the like. And she and I spoke about what it meant for her to be retired. She at the time in the community that she had served as the rabbi had been a beloved member of that community and a leader for about 20 years, as shocking as it may sound, but true. And yet, she had noticed that things had slowly become different. She had contemplated and was sure that she was going to drive back to the community to be with them to observe Yom Kippur, only to realize that it may not be the right community for her to be worshiping. In fact, her immediate her her immediate successor had to leave the position because he had found that community to be toxic. And she finally was beginning to acknowledge that she herself may have had a role in some of that toxicity. That six families and six families only really ever inviting her into their homes. And she didn't recognize and, and realize and had only begun at this moment that the community had changed, the river changed, and she changed and was not the same person before. She chose not to go this year. She chose to find a new path. Nostalgia is a funny thing, I find. In almost every ideal, in almost every moment, we idealize our past and our history. We kind of hold on to it for the same reason of the sunk cost when we think back of GM, we latch on to how it used to be for us, those very expectations after all, it's so much easier. But I wanna share another example, another painful example that is currently going on in our Reformed Jewish community. I am sure some of you are aware that from this past, from this time last year to now, there has been many, many scandals, unfortunately, three specifically. And we have seen the reform movement itself, a movement which began in 1873, start to face some deep and unsettling truths, a movement which at its height served synagogues during a prime time in the American religious world when there was so much booming and occurring in the 1950s and 60s when congregations desperately needed nationwide movements with some monopoly there where they supplied the rabbis, the prayer books, the curriculum, and the youth movement. The union, of course, worked very hard to perpetuate that system and it kept reinventing itself by establishing the Religious Action Center in 1961, a summer youth trip and program in the 1970s, connecting teenagers with Israel and with other people. And yet, we also are aware that in this most recent report, which came out from the 1970s until recently, there were 17 incidents where adults engaged in inappropriate relations with minors. 
There were 16 incidents of misconduct between minors and 39 between adults. The Hebrew Union College, my seminary, equally faced difficult reports where it became apparent that it was a good old boys club at times, that sexual harassment and accusations had occurred for decades, and that it itself was dealing with issues of decreased attendance, contemplating of what to do about the Cincinnati campus, decreased amount of money being fundraised, and wondering what system are we perpetuating? The CCAR too faced its own internal investigation in how it handled allegations of misconduct and abuse from high profile reform rabbis, including testimony from rabbis who said that they felt disincentivized to report allegations out of concern it could hurt their career prospects. It too was described as a good old boys club. The CCAR in response took several steps, including a lengthy apology, where they said, quote, we acknowledge that women and LGBTQ plus colleagues in particular have reported experiencing both implicit and overt bias in the past. And we apologize for this pain and continue to reflect on this difficult history. Although our placement system has evolved in significant ways in recent years, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge the past. HUC began a similar chuva process. It is contemplating after closing at Cincinnati campus what that chuva group entitled the chuva group will look like and do. And the URJ also has remapped and announced continued plans to update its staff and training and policies for its youth programming. It's still wondering and I believe rightfully so about centralizing its system and the role that it will continue to play in the fact in the face that its business model needs to change. The URJ's primary funding source is summer camps and congregations, which now as a result of the pandemic find itself experiencing tremendous stress. Is the URJ still functioning? In a sunk cost fallacy, I would argue perhaps the number of choices available for Jews is much more than ever before. There's online programs and curricula. There's ability for communities and individuals to find diverse small programs. It is time for the URJ itself to continue to not just function as it had in a static past, but recognize that the river is changing and we to ourselves must evolve. When we think about this issue in our own personal life, I want us to also contemplate something. When are we personally locked into our own private bubble? where we have made decisions that reflect a static world that we wish existed, where we respond to that river in our heads as if the world was still static around us, where we react sometimes extremely thinking about a situation that is this only in our heads, where we get so angry and suffer when the river no longer matches the expectations we came in with it. Kol Nidre is in fact about letting us, it's about helping us let go. It asks us to see the river is changing. It asks us more importantly to see that we are changing. It asks us to recognize the challenges in our life and encourages us to rise up to those very challenges. By letting go, we can move from static, we can move from painful situations, we can enter the flow and float. No man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he is not the same man.